Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for Nonprofit HR's virtual learning educational event. Today's session is entitled Reset, Identify, Develop, and Sustain High-Performing People for Your Social Enterprise. My name is Alicia Shoshinsky, and I am the Managing Director of Talent and Development at Nonprofit HR. I'm going to be your moderator for today, and we have a lot of great content, so let's jump right in. But before we do, I would like to go over a few items so that you know how to best participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation listening over your computer speaker system by default. So if you prefer to join by telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and then the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions in the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect those and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the session. Today's event is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email within the next few days with a link to view the recording and uh, live attendees will also receive recertification codes for SHRM and HRCI in the coming days. Today's session is hosted by Patty Hampton, Chief Social Impact Officer for Social Impact Talent Advisors, better known as CETA by Nonprofit HR. CETA is a nonprofit HR collaborative that supports the people management needs of the social enterprise community. You won't meet a more pleasant, passionate, and committed talent management champion than Patty. Nationally recognized as a beacon of light for the social sector and their people management, since 2001, Patty has served in a dual leadership capacity as vice president and managing partner for nonprofit HR. Among her many accomplishments with the firm, Patty helped to build its infrastructure, culture, and workplace, workforce. Today, as its executive in residence, Patty is the creator of the firm's Social Enterprise Collaborative and spearheads multiple strategies and business initiatives. In her role as managing partner, Patty leads the, co leads the firm's business and financial strategies and is a member of the senior management team. And today's, today, Patty is joined by three very special guests, all with extensive experience in the social enterprise community. I'd first like to inter introduce Rebecca Peel. Rebecca specializes in designing performance-focused people and culture strategies for the social impact sector and has spoken and shared her work at multiple prestigious events, including the Obama White House, the World Summit Youth Award, Harvard Business School, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the World Congress on Information Technology. In her most recent position as head of talent at RippleWorks Foundation, Rebecca supported social engineers to overcome barriers to scale. She's held multiple senior leadership positions within the philanthropic sector, including Associate Director of Talent and People Management at the Rockefeller Foundation. Next, I'd like to introduce Cedric Nwofor. Cedric has a passion for agriculture and its people. He is a social entrepreneur and public speaker who has organized, facilitated, and spoken at various African and U.S. events. He's the founder of Roots Africa, a youth-led organization that combats hunger, poverty, and exclusion by connecting students and agriculture experts in the U.S. to farming communities in Africa. While earning his bachelor's degree, Cedric visited farms in Idaho and Maryland, as well as R Rwanda, L Liberia, Cameroon, Ghana, and Uganda to learn different farm life and management approaches. Along the way, Cedric became an agriculture evangelist, engaging African youth in civic affairs in both cities and rural communities. And finally, I'd like to introduce Rebecca Dre. Originally from the United Kingdom, Rebecca started her career in the hospitality industry, working for Marriott Hotels. She transitioned into the charitable sector, supporting uh, mental health advocacy groups, and then founded her first social enterprise business in 2006. She went on to run a group of eight social entre enterprises in the UK, all engaged in social procurement contracting and supported employment. Rebecca sat on the boards of regional and national social membership, social enterprise membership organizations and traveled um, the country giving presentations, training and mentorship to the social enterprise sector. Rebecca moved to the U.S. in 2014 and started two social enterprises, Society Profit, Profits and Buy Social USA. So welcome to all of our panelists. You will have the opportunity to ask questions of our panelists throughout the webinar and during a formal Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, Patty, I'm gonna hand it over to you to take us through. Thanks, Alicia. Welcome, Rebecca D and Cedric and Rebecca P. 
Um, we have a lot to cover today, as Alicia mentioned. Uh, we're going to spend a really good 90 minutes together. And at the root of this is the great need that social enterprises have to identify, develop, and sustain their people management practices. But just a bit about nonprofit HR, which Alicia has alluded to. And uh, Alicia, next slide. At CETA, uh, at non by nonprofit HR, um, we are the first global talent management collaborative exclusively designed to support the HR people needs of social enterprise community. We were founded in 2019, and uh, we are back, of course, by our parent company, Nonprofit HR, with 20 years of, of serving the social sector. We're trusted advisors and, of course, thought partners. We offer total life cycle solutions for people management, and we are um, providing direct partnership with social enterprises, foundations, social incubators, B Corps, and impact investors. And of course, I love to say we're woman and minority owned. Next slide, Alicia. And here's what we're going to unpack today. So you have before you uh, why your people are key to the success of your social enterprise, best practices in, I have things in my way, best practices in attracting a mission-focused workforce, actionable steps to engage and sustain a culture that will help meet your business priorities and characteristics of high-performing people who own their results. However, before we get started, many of us um, who are on the call probably already know that we, there are lots of definitions around social enterprise. And what I wanted to share was our definition here at CETA, what a social enterprise is and, and what we believe it to be. And here at CETA, we believe enterprises create, develop, and innovate solutions that have sustainable social impact across the world. Simply put, social enterprises are communities where everyone is a change activist. I like to include my panel now. Uh, Alicia, if you can go back just one slide, stay on that one just for a bit. I like to pull in uh, my experts and they too have definitions around social enterprises and what that means for them. Um, so why don't I give you all a chance to give your definition and share your definition of a social enterprise. Rebecca Dre, let's start with you. Thanks, Patty, and it's great to be here. Um, yeah, so this is actually a topic that I talk about a huge amount here in the States. Um, so when I worked in the UK, there were legal business entity types for social enterprises. So it was super easy for the public and buyers um, to identify a social enterprise by its legal definition, a bit like a 501c3 here. And then when I moved to the States, I'm like, wow, you can be one of seven or more legal entity types in the States. So it's really difficult <laughs> for people to identify. And then when you look at the definition, it's kind of vague and um, particularly doing the work that I do around trying to bring social procurement to the US. So basically big corporates and governments buying from social enterprises. The main barrier for them was how do we know they're a social enterprise because there isn't this like standard countrywide definition and there isn't a legal entity type that we can identify so really that was why we set up society profits and did a certification for social enterprises because then we could say it doesn't matter what your legal entity type is if you meet this definition and these standards you're a social enterprise so for us it is a, a mission focused organization that reinvests or dedicates more than 50% of its profit to realizing uh, an impact for people or planet and one that is asset locked so that it cannot have that profit diverted into uh, bonuses or, or shareholder payouts or whatever. It's, it's asset locked into the mission of the organization. Great. Thanks so much, Rebecca. 
And Cedric, how about you? Um, I would say Rebecca Dre stole my answer, but she has done a lot more work in that area than me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll just dive in a little bit and, and talk um, about this aspect of, of actual nonprofit that um, are so like focused on like, let's get the funding that they lose sight of that core mission, right? Um, we have these ventures that are normally um, social enterprises that are for-profit ventures, but we as, as non-profit, as people who run non-profit, we also along the way lose sight of that in the, in the pursuit of funding. Funding is important, but we always have to stay true to that core belief. If not, we've started flipping the script despite the legal title that we will have at the 501c3 or as a non-profit, I think it's, it's key along this journey to also understand that this is um, that 50% that Rebecca Dre just talked about. Sometimes in the non-profit world, we also flip that in our pursuit for money. So we need to also put that into consideration as we define ourselves as social enterprise. And, I'll, and I think I'll pass it over to Rebecca P. Thanks, Cedric. Rebecca P? <laughs> Rebecca and Cedric stole my answer. Um, <laughs> in its, it's simplest definition for me, if you are taking an entrepreneurial approach to tackling, tackling a global or social issue, I would identify you as a social entrepreneur. And then really, I'm not going to touch on the actual organization aspect because I thought Rebecca Dre's definition was so phenomenal. And I really appreciate that there was a structural component to being asset locked, which you don't always hear, as well as that 50% case. So just a big hats off to the people who came before me. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So as we all can agree, of course, I did hear for profit, nonprofit. What I didn't hear, I don't think was hybrid. Um, so in addition to what you see before you on the screen, uh, we also consider hybrid organizations, which are your uh, corporate socially responsible organizations as well. Um, so let's move on. So I'm sure joining us, uh, no doubt, on the call today, um, on the webinar today, are um, emerging startup organizations, so welcome. These are organizations that have three years or less, um, have been in business for three years or less. Um, we also identify and welcome growth creators. Uh, we identify here at CETA by Nonprofit HR that these are organizations that have three, that have been in business for three to seven years. And then the more established organizations, uh, established entrepreneurship organizations. And these are organizations that have been in business for seven or more years uh, operating. And I make this distinction because social enterprises, as you just heard, are, are at different points on their business journey regarding their growth and why people are key to uh, business success and as they scale. So I wanted to make sure that I shared uh, the definitions, the variety of definitions that you just heard, but there are some similarities um, that I hope you picked up on as well. And you can see yourself as we continue with our conversation. Next slide. So we have arrived as to why your people are key to the success of your social enterprise. Let me first just touch on the fact that people drive your mission and deliver results based on your vision. People need to understand your purpose, um, why you exist, uh, impact. What does impact mean? What is the value the organization is creating internally as well as externally? Is everyone able to describe an organi your organization's ecosystem? You hear the word ecosystem quite a bit uh, if you have uh, followed uh, social enterprises and uh, the ecosystem, but also the community. Uh, I know here at CETA, we also are very intentional about our culture, uh, values, our beliefs, and our behaviors, wanting to make sure that they align with uh, your business and your social enterprise. And then look at the communities that you serve as well. Um, who are your stakeholders? I believe, which I'm sure you've seen on LinkedIn quite a bit, 
Um, I really believe that every person that you employ has a purpose already inscribed on their heart. So take that in just for a little bit. The people that you will be hiring already have a purpose inscribed on their heart. And you need to tap into what I like to call that special sauce as to what makes a difference. So as we go deeper into conversations, let's start thinking about your top performers. What do they look like, right? Who are they? I'm sure you have hundreds that you have uh, wanted to talk to as you've been growing your business over the years. Uh, you should be able to answer several questions that you hear uh, from our experts today, like what ingredients? We're talking about special sauce that top performers have. So what are the ingredients? What are the behaviors? What do you need to look for that will engage the person you intend to hire? And do you already have people already in mind that are already working for you? Maybe you can use them as a benchmark. I encourage you to use them as a benchmark. If you have employees already in your social enterprise, go back and ask them why they said yes. I often welcome people to nonprofit HR and people will tell you in a heartbeat, all the newbies that we have, I always say, welcome home, right? So go back, I encourage you to go back and ask the people that said yes, to your organization, why did they say yes? You really should be able to answer that question. Alicia, before I go on, are there any burning questions that people wanna get in around the definition of a social enterprise? I haven't seen any at this time, Patty. So you're welcome to con continue. Okay, thank you very much. So my panel of experts, here we go. Question number one for you all. Why do you believe people are critical for the success of your social enterprise? Cedric, why don't I start with you? Okay, so I will go here from the perspective of a uh, younger nonprofit. Um, you saw the chat that Patty showed. Um, at Roots Africa, we are a small nonprofit and growing. Um, and I think one thing that COVID has, has done is really just showed us that your buildings don't matter. The people that you have in those buildings are what matters the most. And we've, we've always heard that like, people are our greatest resources, but um, we take that for granted. The other, I think a few months back, I actually started and asked myself this question, like, what is like Roots Africa's asset? Like, what, what do we own, right? And eventually I just saw that we own people. We've built a coalition of the willing, right? As young nonprofits, you that's all you have you have to bring different individuals together that are passionate for the cause or introduce them to the cause to become passionate about the cause so um for example we have volunteers in the u.s we have students in the u.s that video conference with students in africa these students in africa reach out to farming communities and support farmers and um, when you look at it you think that there is an organization but really there are people of goodwill that have come together and to me um, that is the only asset that we have and um, going after those types of people finding out who they are and um, and recruiting them to come in and work with us is the biggest quest and that's exactly what my role is finding these individuals the journey that cannot be done by the founder of an organization is a journey that you need to bring great minds together to achieve so um, that's why people are important to us, and um, it's, it's basically why we exist today. Great. Thanks so much, Cedric. Rebecca P., how about you? I mean, just to add and emphasize what Cedric said, and I think everyone here knows it, you can have any strategy built out in your mind to deliver on your mission statement and to try to drive that impact. But if you can't get the right people, it just stays a strategy and idea and you don't actually get to the impact. So for me, your people are your future impact. And I think the ability to attract, engage them and set them up to deliver is the most important thing any leader is gonna do. And if you're an HR professional like myself or Patty, we're here to help leaders do that well. Thank you. Rebecca Dre. 
have nothing more to add other than I'm stealing Cedric's line on a coalition of the willing, because that's just fantastic. I love it. <laughs> I wrote that one down too, Rebecca. I loved it. A coalition of the willing. See what you started, Cedric? <laughs> <laughs> So how about any secret sauce um, or ingredients? I have already noted that um, I focus on behavior-based competencies, especially in the time that we're in right now, um, cultural competencies, uh, as well as lived experiences. What else, what other sort of uh, ingredients, if you will, that you look for in top performers or high performing people? I'm happy to hop in, Patty. Um, I love this question. I I hear secret sauce a lot and it's very <laughs> nebulous. Mm -hmm. For me, secret sauce is someone's attempt to codify what makes your organization perform in your people. I like to think of it as a combination of your employer value proposition. So those sources of value that are why someone said yes, as Patty pointed out, they're why people stay in your org and they're the pieces of value that make it impossible for someone to leave or go on. Knowing and understanding that is gonna help you attract and retain and honor that. So I, I take that value proposition, I combine it with culture and beliefs. And for me, culture is really your values which drive the behavior, which create your organizational culture, which in turn gets you to that impact. And then, you know, also as Patty said, there's going to be a core set of competencies or sometimes aptitudes, those hints of a competence that are going to help you get the right people that you need. That's going to be dependent on your strategy and the type of organization you need to build to deliver on your mission. Exactly. Thanks for that, Rebecca P. Rebecca Dre, how about you and your organization? Yeah, I would say that my hiring practice has changed so much over the years from learning what didn't work more than anything, really. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I feel in the social enterprise world that you really need to have people that understand how to have like one foot in the nonprofit world, one foot in the for profit world or the corporate world or whatever you want to call it, because I think the social enterprise space sometimes falls into the trap of thinking that profit is a dirty word and like Cedric talked about this earlier <laughs> and you know but actually no profit means no impact you know because you're not trying to be grant reliant then you would just be a non-profit you're trying to be a social enterprise and have a business mindset to what you're doing but if you're all business it's a problem and if you're all non-profit it's a problem you have to understand that it's a balance of the two and I, and I think that that is something tends to be somewhat unique I think to to people so now I I like you Patty I interview based on connection and feeling with people because you can have anything you like written on a resume I'd rather have somebody come spend half a day <laughs> with the team or you know with with other people that I trust and say, what do you feel? You know, never mind what's just on your resume. What what do we feel about each other? Is it a fit? Do you understand our passion? So that for me is my secret sauce. Great. That's exactly right, Rebecca. And you know what I've learned over you know the last several years, um, the sector in general now has sort of shifted and it is about lived experiences. We're going beyond what the resume calls for and what the resume says. Not that people lie on their resumes. However, however sometimes they're over embellished. And so you have to get down into uh, what moves them, what inspires them, what are they passionate about, like Cedric said in the beginning. And I have to keep repeating, Cedric, the coalition of the willing. So for you, Cedric, what has been some secret sauce that you've looked for in high-performing people? So um, for all the entrepreneurs, um, the young entrepreneurs out there or the new organizations, you know that um, this is a tough question. You don't even ask yourself this question because it's like when somebody says, I want to be in your organization, yeah, you're like, yes, call me. Um, because you need that help, right? Um, so 
what I do is I really go now and, and kind of retro that, like, go back and see why did they join. I think uh, Rebecca Phil talked about it earlier, uh, or with Rebecca Dre. Um, why did they join the organization, right? And, and really go back and understand their motivation, not just so I could use it in the future to attract individuals like them, but more so so that I could keep them longer. Um, if they joined because they wanted to have a strategic role within the organization, am I providing them with those opportunities to be strategic? Um, if they joined because they cared about fundraising, am I providing them with those opportunities to do fundraising? I think that is, that is really key. But um, one thing that uh, Rebecca Dre touched on that I want to add to is this aspect of that, that, that for-profit mindset. Um, I think it's critical for every nonprofit to be thinking that way because we get negligent um, in, in, in this process. Um, the other day I was on a call of like these small businesses and they came up with this list of how they profile their customers, right? Every single detail about their customers they had in there. Um, they care so much about their customers that is giving them funds. And in the, the non-profit world, we're just like, oh, they're good people, they will give us money. I think we need to do it even more rigorously because um, they are doing it out of the goodness of their heart and we need to care a lot more and provide them that intentionality that um, the for-profit world is doing with their customers. So that mindset, that balance is really important. Great, thanks so much for that, Cedric. So we talked about the secret sauce and the behavior competencies and what you all are looking for. Um, let's talk a little bit more about how you keep them engaged. Once they're hired, what are you doing to keep your folks engaged? And Cedric touched on it already, and we'll talk more about it later, but we can talk about it now as well. Um, he touched on personal development, professional development. What are you offering uh, to keep uh, your employees engaged? Cedric, why don't I start with you? <clears throat> so um, my um, first, first thought about that is, um, figuring again, why did they join? Um, are, they, are they along that track, um, right? What are their motivations um, within, within the organization? Um, the second um, phase to that is um, setting up this, this review sessions where they not only um, review the way our relationship, the way they are working within the organization, but also having a conversation with me, um, identifying ways in which I could be either more useful to them or ways in which I could be more um, impactful for the organization. Because a lot of times, that's when the disagreements really um, come in, when um, the individuals that you bring on board um, find out that either the organization is heading towards a direction that they or, or have, think that they have better ideas, or actually have better ideas for the organization. So that those review sessions are just a, a time for me to become more grounded. Um, to know that um, these are the people that markers, more, matter more and, and focus on them. Um, I think those are the key elements for me in keeping the people that volunteer and work with us. Great. Rebecca P, I see you chomping at the bit to, to dive in here. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, I see your body, I, I see your body moving. <laughs> Cedric kicked off in a really similar vein to how I would tackle this question, which was, for me, once again, in my terms, would have been more, more around your employer value proposition. So you went out and you did your branding across your jobs and you attracted people for these sources of value, whether it was learning and growth, whether it was your purpose, your actual mission statement, what you're going to do in the work and the how that you'll do that. And of course, your comp and Ben is going to be a factor. In social enterprise, I have found there are three primary archetypal drivers of what really needs to be thought of under value proposition. One is, you know, the impact piece is a huge driver. You cannot forget it. Two is learning and growth is massive as part of the social venture space. It often has had a bigger role in value proposition than in other ventures, particularly for a social venture that cannot compete on cash. And then the third is what I call environment, and that's everything from the workspace and the how to your compensation and benefits. For me, when it comes to um, engagement in that ongoing way we motivate people, 
you need to put the systems and checks in place across those different archetypes to make sure you're meeting all of them. You are gonna get disengaged people if you said, hey, come here for this, and then you don't deliver on that value in a sustained way. So, you know, one way you can do that is through your HR practices, making sure in your performance check-ins, you're baking in how you're checking on those forms of value to that process. It can be in your learning and development offering and checking in to make sure you're in a repeated and systematic way checking in on those forms of value. Um, as, as Cedric kind of mentioned, if you know what sources of value most motivate your people at a team or individual level, that's a really strong toolkit to help your managers take your value proposition and make sure you're narrowing in at an individual level. Um, some of the most disengaged employees I've ever seen are say, you know, at the Rockefeller Foundation, we have a breadth of a mission. And that means we could be really focused on health at one moment and really focused on food and agriculture at another. If someone's number one purpose in the world is to solve infant mortality, and you said, come here, I'm gonna give you the resources and the team to do that, and then you pull that off the table, that is gonna be the most disengaged, unhappy person. So for me, it's about understanding the pivots in your strategy you make that might cause a micro level of that degree of pain. Um, and then figuring out how you're going to manage that. And it's not always manageable. So if you have a big pivot in your strategy and the number one thing someone was born and put in the world to do no longer gets to do that, you really need to think about it and you need to be proactive because it's going to be painful to that person and to your culture if you don't get a plan in place. I'll stop. Yeah, I but couldn't agree more. A couple thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right, Rebecca. I can't. I couldn't agree more. You you touched on something about pivot, right? You said pivot in your strategy. So if you're gonna pivot in your strategy, at least have a conversation with people. Here's why we're pivoting. Here's what we're seeing. Here are the trends that we're seeing, and ask them for their ideas, right? We touched on ideas before. If you want that person to come and live over here with your organization and bring all their passion and commitment to your organization if you're gonna pivot have a conversation at least you owe them that much right Rebecca I'm not Rebecca Dre I'm not leaving you out here what would you like to add no I, I think you really you all said right. it all but um, I'm just agreeing with all of you but I think I think in this social enterprise space it's really important to give of yourself like be authentic to your passion and why you did this and also listen to other people's passion and their reason and their why and um i actually hired somebody this morning so this is quite relevant and this morning <laughs> this morning i uh was talking through this with a potential employee she's been to uh, the office and and done some you know did a half day meeting everybody the team love her and she said to me on the phone you know, but I've got this idea for like a, a thing that I'd like to specialize in in maybe a year. And and like, is that going to be possible or should I set that up as a, you know, something else that I do? And I was like, no, bring it on. You know, <laughs> like really, if you have a passion for something and it fits within our mission, I'd love you to spearhead that and, and take it forward. And she was so excited. She's like, oh, my goodness, I never worked anywhere where people just are so open to the idea of a new person bringing a new idea and running with it. And I was like, well, you know, to me, this is how we evolve all the time as an organization. So, so yeah, listening to people's passion right. and, and giving of your own passion is so important, I think. Yeah, give them the space to run free, as we say at CETA and at our parent company as well. Uh, Rebecca, I have a follow-up question for you. Um, Knowing that you've you've worked in and and run um, 500 plus organizations, 500 employees plus, and then of course where you are today, um, I'm sure you have a story to share about um, a successful hire and a not so successful hire. Um, and I'll ask that um, both Cedric and Rebecca, of course, begin to think about that too. If you have something to add, but Rebecca. 
I have a feeling that you have something <laughs> to share. So, do you know, actually, I have a great example of that, which was, and this is, this just shows you the learning curve of setting up your first social enterprise. So the first one I ever set up, it was like a multi-use center and it had a cafe, restaurant, um, gift shop that was going to support, uh, do supported employment with people that had struggled to be in employment. And in the setup process, I used to go and sit and work in a coffee, a well-known coffee chain that shall not be mentioned. And um, there was this barista who was amazing. Like just every time you went in there, he like remembered you, he, he knew your name, he remembered what you usually ordered. He was so chatty and personable. So while I'm thinking about running this um, coffee shop, I was like, huh, this guy could be amazing. Like, so, because he would be great, like to bring people, you know, they would all feel good when they came in the coffee shop. So I stole him from this organization. I, I offered him a job and said, hey, do you want to come over to this startup? You know, and he's like, oh yeah. He was the worst employee I ever had. And not because he wasn't a lovely person, <laughs> but because he had, come from this world of everything being in an employee manual right and in the social mm. enterprise space i needed somebody who could be thinking on their feet who could pivot who could use their initiative who could like we were creating a business that had not been created before you know so running that kind of social enterprise cafe in the city we were nothing else like that existed and we had to let him go and it was really all I felt terrible about it but the person we hired in this place was actually a woman who had a teenage son who was on the autism spectrum and she had worked in a corporate setting she was the most perfect person to run that space because she absolutely understood the compassion that you needed and the motivational skills you needed for the people we we're trying to support but she also understood that we were there to make money and run a really good business. So it was like, that's my good and bad at the same time. That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that, Rebecca. Um, Cedric, Rebecca, P, what do you have to add? Um, I will add a little, and, and this was my error, right? Um, a lot of times somebody may see something about Ruth Africa on social Wait, media. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Cedric, are you admitting as a leader that this was my mistake? <laughs> yes, I, I messed love up. it. <laughs> so, um, so, so most often people would see something on social media or see a video and, and reach out like, hey, I want to volunteer for Ruth Africa. I want to do something. And I would say, oh yeah, sure, come in. I could give them a few options of what they could do um and and it's always very challenging with competing priorities um onboarding is is almost tend to fall at the bottom line of, of the things that i need to do each day for the organization and there is this individual his name is charles um he he reached out and, and said hey i want to help you guys and super passionate wanted to do so much um with us but again it got pushed down. I did not take the time to onboard them and give them the opportunity to know more about the organization. And over time, I, I realized how much we were missing out from this individual bringing his resources, bringing his goodwill, his expertise to support us. Like it's our loss and, and it's, it's, it's on me not figuring out a way to bring him on. And um, looking back and understanding his why, um, having very, uh, different conversations with him, understanding why he wanted to support us. I actually realized that this would be the perfect person to help us set up a volunteer program where we set up each of the stages that um, people within, uh, people that reach out to us, that want to volunteer, that want to come and work with us in different capacity, be it you want to travel into the African continent and work with farmers, you want to work with our students in the US, you want to help us with building the right foundations for the organization. Whatever that capacity is, this individual is going to build up a program that will make this uh, make volunteers come in and be engaged. And this is something that I think is important. While it shouldn't be misused, but um, a lot of times when people raise problems or when people make you see problems, sometimes they are the solution. 
right? Um, I do not have the capacity to actually have that entire onboarding process, but figuring out that these were his skill sets, these are his passions, allow me to give him that opportunity to really make what would be a huge impact for the organization going down, uh, moving forward. So um, that is my error, and that's how I <laughs> um, corrected it. Uh, Rebecca, will you hire me um, after telling you about my, my weakness and my strength? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah Rebecca P <laughs> yeah um, so I'll share a specific type of mishire I think most of us are really privileged to be able to attract purpose driven extremely talented people an area that I still I'm still honing and I'm still honing all my practice areas is around maximizing value between yourself and a hire specifically as it pertains to learning and growth i think we've all hired people who were a perfect culture match ex had all the competences they needed but were disengaged and unhappy in the role because we didn't get someone who was happy to do the work we needed done and that's a painful mishire i think in you know google has the privilege of being able to say we're just going to get culture and whatever and we can move you around our company if the role isn't right but often in social venture we're resource constricted and we have specific roles we need to get done so we can't just hire really smart purpose-driven people that are you know a good match so for me one of my favorite questions i'll share because i think it's a great toolkit in anyone's interview practice is what are the forms of value or learning and growth that you hope to get during your time in this position? And then really listen and make sure what someone wants to learn, the skill set someone wants to build, is aligned with what your organization needs to achieve. Um, a specific example at the Rockefeller Foundation, we would hire program associates into all of our verticals health food etc and i'd get lots of applicants who wanted to work on their thought leadership the reality of that role is it's someone writing grants and doing research for a managing director who is doing thought leadership so being able to hone in and make sure that if you have all your other ducks in a row you're aligning as much value on the actual capabilities and learning someone's going to have to me is one of the really important success metrics that you need to hone in on once you have the other nuts and bolts in your hiring system put together. Um, and it just, it helps avoid these painful mishires where you have sharp, talented people that are super unhappy and they just stay there, but they complain a lot and it makes management hard. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, when you were talking, Rebecca, I, the image of one of our clients just saying, I just need some butts in seats. And so <laughs> I was just like, no, it's a little bit more than that. You don't <laughs> want to uh, rehire all of 12 of those people. So how about we not go in that direction? So we were able to reshift them, if you will. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Alicia, let's go on to the next slide. We've sufficiently beat up this question. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about best practices in attracting a mission-focused workforce. Uh, this one is my favorite. Um, Rebecca and, and all of them have already, Rebecca and Cedric and Rebecca D have already touched on brand identity. I heard that in a lot of your responses. And can people see themselves when they visit your website? That is what's key right now, especially for social enterprises. If you put up certain websites, I won't say what sector, but certain websites, and then you put up a website that's um, in the social enterprise space, you can see a difference. You really can. And people need to see themselves when they visit your website. Do you have an inclusive culture that is being demonstrated through your website, right? The other one that's my favorite on this area is around best practices is engaging in storytelling. All of you already know that social enterprises know how to tell a story. So you need to engage in storytelling. It's very simple to do. And I do it a lot when I 
uh, interview people as well. People often ask me, well, how did you and Lisa meet? Well, it's a great story there. And I always start with, well, Lisa and I met in a cab. I have you intrigued already, right? So Lisa Brown Alexander, she is a CETA strategic advisor, and she's also our founder of the parent company. So I did, I met Lisa in a cab ride. We went to the same meeting and we shared a cab ride pre-COVID 20 years ago. <laughs> and so, um, and I, I'm still at nonprofit HR. I never left. There's a reason for that. She told a story. I told a story. Together, we're still telling <laughs> the same story. And you can see our passion. You can feel our passion when you talk to us about um, the organization. And guess what? I was a top performer. I still am a top performer, right? And Lisa recognized that. I know she did. Else, why would she hire me, right? And so I hope uh, to continue to serve um, the, the, in this space and uh, most important is, is about the legacy uh, that we leave behind, right? And we still today have legacy clients, two of them, in fact, that I will not name, that we're still servicing 20 years later. That is an engaging story that you can tell people when you're uh, having a conversation with them. And I don't mean to brag, right? But what, is, what it means to be a top performer is, is about your story, your story. What's the story that you're telling? What's the story that you're sharing in the interview process? What's your vision? Are you really purposefully telling them and sharing them about your vision and the purpose of your organization? Why does your organization exist today? What is the short-term game plan and what is the long-term game plan? They need to buy into what that vision and what that story is. So demonstrating that in your, in an inclusive culture and offering a culture of belonging, right? With DEI, where we are today in this country, people wanna know, do I belong in this culture that you've created? Or am I going to be treated fairly? Am I gonna be respected? Um, and Rebecca uh, Peel mentioned earlier about compensation structure and benefit offerings. And uh, Cedric also mentioned about professional and uh, personal development, right? And leaning and, and a learning culture uh, is also what we shared earlier. One of my, my, one of my favorites is around the WIFM. Do you guys know what WIFM is? What's in it for me? People wanna know, you called me. I'm happy over here at company A, organization A, but you tap me on the shoulder to come and work over here with your organization. What's on their mind? What's in it for me? I call that the WIFM approach. So people are looking for a well-being holistic approach to attracting them to your organization. What are you offering? Right, Rebecca Peel said it earlier and all of you have mentioned it. What's the value? What's your value proposition? Are they buying into that, right? And then we talked about lived experiences. Do you want people on your team that have a coaching mentality, that have mentoring behaviors and skills, right? And, and do they embrace, I know for the social enterprise sector, there is this, um, uh, what I call a servant leadership style. They want to serve. You have a, a leadership style that where you want to serve and you want the organization to thrive. So you have a servant and thriving approach to leading. Do you want your top performers to have the same? Then you need to interview for that. So I would, I could go on and on about this one, but I want to bring in my panelists again. Um, so Cedric, share with us some best practices that you've used to attract mission focus, uh, a mission focused or high performing talent. Um, I, I would say you've touched on most of them. Um, I think that story piece is, is critical. 
I'm uh, so good. One, I'm a top performer. Remember that. Yes. <laughs> um, the one one of the things, absolutely, you are, buddy. Um, one of the things that um, I I really focus on is would they would they have the opportunity to make a difference, right? Um, when you are running a, a, a social enterprise, it, it's easy for you to be doing a thousand different things at once, right? You're doing fundraising, you're doing strategic planning, all of these things, you're doing them. And um, because, uh, because of that sometimes founder syndrome, you get to um, touch on everything and overshadow um, everyone else. So my goal is, how do I make sure that I let them shine, right? This is something that is, is it's a constant battle because sometimes um, by you not being at the forefront and saying, hey, this is an initiative that I'm leading, means that the initiative doesn't get the, the audience that it could get or the, attract, or the, the attraction that it could get. But um, it's a constant battle to figure out how do you ensure that you give somebody a task when they excel in that task, you put them at the forefront as the success. And showing them as well, like, hey, this is the role that you can play. The good news about smaller organizations is that it's easy to tie holding a donor letters to how it makes an impact for the organization. And, and to me, that's something that I hope to carry on as we grow Roots Africa and moving forward. Being able to tie every single activity that's being done in the organization to the impact that it has on the organization. Um, for example, if a donor reaches out and says, hey, I really appreciated your thank you note, or I really appreciated the way you thank me, I will send that to the person that did, did that, and they're like, like carried out that activity so that they can see for themselves like, hey, this is not just, this is not just checking a box, this is actually important work. So for me, that's one of the ways in which I try to retain and attract people. Great, thanks for sharing that, uh, Cedric. Rebecca P and Rebecca Dre, um, anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I'll jump in. So on the attraction piece, I'll bring it back to understanding your value proposition again. And if you're thinking to yourself, as Cedric mentioned, I'm doing a million things, it doesn't have to be that hard. When you ask a candidate, when you're interviewing them, why do you want to work at X? you're getting an answer to tell you what your perceived value proposition is in the market. Every time you ask that question, it's an opportunity to write down what you hear and start codifying what people think your value proposition is. Go ask your three highest performers, what is the piece of value that keeps you here? And you're gonna know what is your lived value proposition. And if you're doing exit interviews, it's as simple as asking, what was the hardest thing to give up? when making the choice to leave. And, and that, that system, that check is feeding back into your understanding of value proposition. Once you know what that is, how you're gonna attract top talent is to take that value proposition and bake it into your employer branding. And this will come down to how you're talking about the work and the very language you're using. Are you using words that are going to attract creative problem solvers if that's what you're offering use the right attraction language um at living goods where um i was for a couple of years a couple of years ago we had a really strong value proposition that actually needed to be changed depending on what roles we were recruiting for our mission was to reduce infant mortality when it came to attracting in our San Francisco office, that was the number one driver we needed to make really clear was you're going to change the world and have the opportunity to help drop infant mortality We're 20 by 25 percent where we work. When it came to hiring the branch staff in Kenya and Uganda that would actually manage the work, many of them came from last mile healthcare. That wasn't a differentiator for a value proposition. For them, the language we needed to use is do you want to become an outstanding manager and get the best management training in the world. And that's the number one source of value for that human being. So beyond understanding and codifying what your value proposition is, make sure you're asking yourself, are there variants to this within my company that I need to consider when I'm hiring? Um, so I think 
when it comes to attracting, really taking the value proposition work and making sure you're thoughtfully putting it in to your job descriptions and your branding. Make sure if you don't have your philosophy and your work on anti-racism and diversity, equity, and inclusion, you get it up there fast and you do the work. Many people I know in our space will not consider an employer that doesn't have a stance or at least doesn't have a stance saying, we're working on our stance. We know this isn't good enough. We'll get there fast. Um, and then I think the third thing when it comes to attracting really good talent as a um, as, as a nugget that I think is is helpful is make sure you're carving out specifically in social venture, talking a little bit of the how you do your work. Because there's a lot of people solving the same problem and you want to attract people that are not only fired up about the problem you're solving, but actually how you're solving it and listen for that in your interviews. They can't just care about the issue you're solving. They actually have to be deeply committed and invested in thinking your approach is the number one approach to get there. Yeah, thanks for that, Rebecca. You touched on something that I'd like to move over uh, to Rebecca Dre. Um, Rebecca Dre, uh, Rebecca Peel touched on already the fact that we're, we're, we're climbing out of three crises, right? One of them uh, around Black Lives Matter, and now we are faced with AAPI and other uh, racially charged issues as well. So what's different? What have you seen that's different in the social enterprise uh, space um, that should that we should be focused on and should be attracting people that will drive the mission forward. What's shifted? Have you noticed anything that's shifted? Yeah, I think people care more than ever right now about who they work for and why they work there. But I think, uh, so one of the things I observe is that social enterprises aren't always fantastic at really talking about their impact and i remember seeing this really interesting study that was about um who are the best people to work for and the worst people to work for during the it was in the early part of the of the pandemic and i think in the top three was walmart on both sides right so they were both yeah. perceived <laughs> as the best and the worst and so to me that's like you know it, it just showed how really perception is truth for most of us what we perceive of an organization it, it becomes the truth of that organization and I think sometimes social enterprises focus too much on the business side not enough on demonstrating impact and um you know i see this doing certification one of the things with the criteria for certification is can you demonstrate the impact that you're making and actually quite a lot of social enterprises are like well we don't really record it like we just help people <laughs> you know <laughs> well that's great but it but it's actually you know that's not going to help you to a to attract people, particularly now, people care more than ever. It matters to them who they want to go and work for and, and feeling invested in the organization. And even, so the, the first time I started a social enterprise was in 2006 and I, um, I've told you this story before, Patty, but I originally started a social enterprise that was in theory gonna be there to support people with mental health conditions. I myself have mental health issues that have plagued me my whole life. And I was very open about that. And I went to another social enterprise that was run by people with mental health conditions. And I said, what do you love about working here? And what would you change before I open our place? And this one guy said to me, I hate the fact that everybody that walks in the front door knows that I have mental illness because mm. all we talk about is that we're here for people with mental illness. And I was so horrified because I realized that I was in theory trying to attract people to an organization that was about getting away from barriers and away from stigma. And actually all I'd done was slap a huge big label on everybody that was coming in the door saying, 
come and love us because these people all have mental health problems, right? So we immediately listened to that and really pivoted our model. And we actually opened up the first social enterprise in the country that had an open door policy. We just said, we don't, we don't really care what your reason is. It doesn't, it's not relevant, really. It's not relevant to us. What's relevant is you're struggling to keep a job or get a job. If that matters to you, come to us. And I did a radio interview to attract people to come and work for us. And I think our business plan said that we would support 45 people in the first year. I did a radio interview and I talked about my personal experience. I talked about this new kind of organization that we were trying to start this new business and said, we're hiring. If you consider yourself that you're disadvantaged in the workplace for whatever reason, or you want to come and work for an organization that's helping people that are, turn up to this open day and learn more about us. And an hour before the open day started, people were queued all the way down the street, all the way around the corner, <laughs> all the way down the next street. Wow. I think we had like 150 people came to our very first day just to learn about the organization because we were really authentic and honest. And we talked about the impact and who we were and why we were trying to do it. So to me, that's, that's a vital piece is, sharing that not being afraid to share what your impact is your why that's right that's right thanks for sharing that story rebecca i appreciate that um so we already have on the screen our uh, next com part of our conversation but before we move on uh, alicia are there any questions uh burning questions that the team here can answer um Yes, Patty, uh, this one um, is a little bit related to um, engagement and some of the things you've been talking about. So how can organizations create intentional space for staff while, for staff well-being while performing fast-paced, high-volume work? Mm, I love that one. Rebecca P. Thank you. Um, that's a great one. I think that's one that has been really hard and important over the last 12 months um, and is always really important. Um, it can feel like sometimes a trade off between creating space for wellness and delivering an outcome in performance. And then you have the burnout paradigm that means if you don't create the safety, you're actually not going to get there anyway. Some some methods I've seen um, more recently in the last 12 months to try to figure out how to create the safety have certainly been around leaders sharing things that they're doing for wellness and really creating the space for other people on their teams and managers to do the same. And that's as much as trying to, as a leader, know that if you're telling your team, we're on Zoom a million hours a day, you don't have to show up with your camera on because we know that that's emotionally and physically and mentally exhausting. But you, as the CEO or a member of the executive team, absolutely always have your camera on. It might send a signal that it's actually not okay. So when you are putting together the things that you know your your team believes they need, and this is can be done through listening sessions. You can do this through staff input surveys of just asking your team, what do you need to feel good right now? What do you need to restore yourselves right now? Make sure that as a leader, even if it's not what you need, but it turns out it's what your team needs, that you're still modeling that behavior. Um, anyone want to add to that? That's kind of, this. it's a big question to unpack. So let's say that that's one idea but there's a lot you can do here. Yeah. I, like a Dre, I, I see your finger in Cedric. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say like a, a practical thing that we did when we had a lot of employees and we started seeing tensions starting to rise up between people. And um, one of the things we did was a piece of work around how you experience the world and it was probably the most valuable thing I ever did with a large staff team that were working in a really 
stressful environment sometimes. So we helped people to understand whether or not they were inferential or direct people. And we actually created what would now be a nice spreadsheet on some, you know, cool cloud software. But at the time, it was a massive whiteboard. And we would say, OK, Rebecca's a, uh, an inferential listener, but a direct speaker or, you know, Cedric is, you know, sees the world this way. And it actually it helped us in the way that we communicated with each other because we're all different people. We all experience things differently. And a classic example, poor communication to me is the is the root of lack of well-being in a in an organization. And part of that can just be that you're expecting other people to experience the world the way that you do. And so um, you know, if I say to you, Paddy, I need this uh report today, and you're uh, or I just say, I need this report typing up, Patty. And you say, okay. And in your head, you're just hearing like, she just needs it whenever. But in my in my mind, I'm thinking, I need it typing like now, you know. Then there's this disconnect between the way that you have heard me and the way that I have said something. And when you learn about the way in which we need information, it's actually super helpful. So if you learn that somebody needs direct, then you're learning that what you're saying is, hey, Patty, see when you type this thing, can I have it in two hours? Is that reasonable? <laughs> right? And That's actually, right. It, it got rid of so much tension in our workforce and really helped people to feel compassion for each other, but to communicate in a really healthy way. So that was a That's top right. Cedric. Um, the only thing Cedric, add, would you like to add? Uh, the only thing that I will add is um, the fact that Sometimes I tell people to take a break, right? Um, there are individuals that would not take a day off. Um, I know other things that they're involved in and all of those things. And um, I ask them to like, hey, take a break and, and go recuperate and, um, and, and then before you come back. I think that is important because it tells them like, hey, this person realizes that I'm working really hard. Um, it may be other things that are happening in their lives and, and, I, and I will ask them to like, hey, Take a break and, and 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 go recuperate a little bit before you come back. Um, because eventually it turns back. It looks it looks like I'm doing it for them, but it turns back and bites me. Um, because if they get disengaged, if they, once they become grumpy, it affects me more. So um, actually intentionally figuring out like, hey, this is what's going on in your life, or these are the things that you've been working on. You need to break a little bit to recuperate, and maybe tapping into Rebecca Peel uh, idea of. Um, sharing with with them what you what i do as well to make sure that i stay on top of um i, I stay engaged is, is also important can i that's yes right and that's right no. yes so to <laughs> yes and cedric on the take a break use your management practice if you're going to implement something like this i've seen this go well and i've seen it go poorly and cause disengagement if cedric as ceo starts telling just his reports to take a break, but the CEO who has the other half of the organization is not doing that, you get a different experience that's gonna cause not great stuff. So when you think this is what the org needs, build a management practice so that you're telling all of your leaders, you know what, we're performing, we're knocking it out of the charts. Let's, let's see what happens if we start telling our people to take more breaks. And you can then have a more consistent experience where you're not going to get these fractures in your culture. So yes to what Cedric said with the also scale it across your org. That's right. That's right. I appreciate you all mentioning uh, all of those because it's heartwarming to know that um, we require that at uh, CETA. And of course, our parent company, we're not top performers are not uh, uh, punch watcher, clock punchers, right? They work on results. It's about results. It's not about how many hours you worked. It's about delivering results. And self-care, especially nowadays, is really, really important. And we as leaders have to practice what we preach. Uh, it's, it can't be any uh, simpler than that. What you have on the screen before you is some actionable steps to an engage uh, high performance. Uh, 
thanks Alicia, <laughs> engage in, in, uh, and sustain a culture. That's really where we're headed um, as we roll into the last few minutes of our conversation here. So on the screen, uh, nonprofit, oops, nonprofit HR, our 2021 Talent Management Priorities Survey, we found that culture and engagement continue to be a top priority. Um, and that's really what we've been talking about here as well. So you see the statistics, uh, the data on the screen, and it couldn't be more true and telling. Uh, we're talking about culture attracting um, and engagement right now. We talked about a learning culture. Look at the percentage there. And then, of course, what we haven't touched on, and we won't do it on this call, but performance management is just as high, right? And then the two obstacles impeding uh, real life organizations realizing talent management priorities, and all of us should know this well, we've already said it up front, it's staff, it's people, and financial resources. I've been in this space a long time, and those have been the two forefront issues um, at the center of what we're talking about today, as well as across all social sectors and social impact sectors. It's always about people and capacity and financial resources, right? So if you're gonna engage um, and sustain a high performing culture that thrives, your priorities have to align, right? We've already mentioned that. Um, so what we haven't mentioned is just some specifics. So let me share that with the folks um, on the webinar today. I don't like the term, um, we talked about well-being, but I don't like the term work-life balance. And so I try my best not to use it. I've even encouraged uh, my business partner, um, Alicia's on the call, she's our managing director of HR. And I said, it's, it's not about work-life balance anymore. It's about how do you integrate your life with your work? right? No one knows that my mom ha is a dialysis patient and she's downstairs. She's probably waiting for me to come and fix her lunch, but it's almost dinner time. So I have a whole nother crew, a whole nother life happening downstairs, one floor below me. And that's happening all around us. And we said it earlier, right? Stay and stay. Have you had stay conversations with the people in your organization that have said yes? I now call them stay or engagement conversations. And then we already talked about a culture of learning. Uh, Cedric said it earlier, it's about personal and professional development. If you have folks that are jazzed about working with your organization, what sort of personal engagement are you engaging them in, right? How about financial literacy? That's a huge one nowadays. Do you invite someone in to teach your uh, folks about financial literacy? And then life purpose, their life purpose has to align with their professional purpose, right? I said it earlier, all of us come to organizations with our purpose already inscribed on our hearts, right? All right, uh, Alicia, next slide. Actually, no, you can stay, you can stay on that one. Stay on the, sorry. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna wrap up a little bit. We probably won't get up to all of these questions. I wanna make sure that we're conscious of our time and also uh, making sure that we can answer any question, burning questions that are in the chat. But as we begin to, to close out, I wanna ask just one question around actionable steps to engage. And I want each of you to, to uh, give some suggestions here. So what are your thoughts on high performing people that um, have an emotional connection with the organization? You should have, um, you touched on that earlier, but why is that so important? Who wants to start? Um, the, the one thing I would say about um, this is, um, and I'm sure the, the two Rebecca's would have a lot more to talk about this, but um, I, I think this is the only reason why we we in the, in the nonprofit world kind of survive, um, is these individuals 
have that drive in them, have, like you said, that purpose inscribed on their heart, like this is what I want to do. Because there is an opportunity cost um, of um, running a, a, a nonprofit or of working in a nonprofit. Um, we could be out there in sales, we could do so much more and make a lot more, um, a lot more money. And um, we have chosen to be in this, in this space. So realizing that and um, ensuring that the, the, the individuals that are within the organization um, know, like, know that, um, understand that purpose and um, ensure and, and, and reminding them of, the, of that. And, and it is, is the reason why we have these organizations and why it, it survives. Great, thank you. Rebecca D, Rebecca P, anything you'd like to add? I mean, I'll just add, it, it seems obvious, but as social ventures, the most important piece of value we're offering people is the opportunity to make meaningful progress towards the impact in our mission statement. You can compromise on a lot of sources of value, but that is the one you absolutely cannot sacrifice. And one of the ways I like to present it as, if someone's life's purpose is to end human trafficking, and that's what they care about, they're obsessed with the problem, you're getting more than 40 hours a week from them. Because everything they do, the articles they read, the forums they participate in, the books they read are adding so much value to your mission. So to me, that's the one that if you don't know how to do it well, um, that's the one you have to get good at doing well to get the right people. And I'd say the double edged sword of that when it comes to engagement is it's going to be the most frustrating disengaged people if they feel like we're not making progress <laughs> fast or X, Y, Z, and we've all heard it. So the number one source of value and it's also going to be one of the most painful things in your culture to keep people engaged is this frustration to do it faster harder better <laughs> great thank you so much rebecca uh, d anything you'd like to add I, no i think they've they've said it all <laughs> i i could tell more stories okay, but i think great. that we need time for <laughs> me too one of my favorite subjects. Alicia, last slide for us, please. All right, so I'm gonna run through at least my top 10. And if you guys want to do a yes and, uh, not a problem. So um, characteristics of a high performing people who own their results, we've said most of this already. It's about commitment and passion, entrepreneurial mindset, and an innovative itch. I call it an innovative innovation itch. Focus on people, coach and mentors, positive outlook on the mission, self-manage. People self-manage their time. Time management is critical. Uh, they push through procrastination. I am a top performer and I push through procrastination. Uh, they're humble and audacious. They embrace performance feedback. So if you have a top performer in your organization and you're not providing them with any feedback, they're going to seek it somewhere else. Uh, they take initiative. All of you have already experienced that. Uh, their solutions focus. I think Rebecca Peel said it best around value that they're bringing to the organization. And then uh, they value networking. I am a troll on LinkedIn and I look to engage with people in an open conversation, especially around social enterprise uh, space. I want to network. I want to uh, you know, dive into this space in a way that it feeds my soul. It literally feeds my soul. So anything you like to add in terms of uh, characteristics of a high performing people? Yes, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say in 90% of the round one culture interviews I have built for organizations, 50% of my time is spent on learning. It's identifying why learners 
unpacking learning motivations and aligning learning motivations. And it's assessing for a growth mindset. So that growth learning orientation. And then an interesting piece around learning and feedback and feedback actually just being data for learning. So high performing people to me, I break down learning and I'd have four different segments strictly focused on learning um, would be my yes and to let's take the list of 10 and then pull learning out three more and make it 13. There you go. Uh, I I think there are a few that the, there were just there were, I had to be things on my list and learning and applying was was one of them. So Rebecca already touched on that. Um, I think um, empathy is really, really important for, for, for me and for the organization. Um, I, I faced, I, I, because we are dealing with, so the other day we were doing like a stakeholder analysis and bringing together all the various moving pieces um, that are included in the organization in order for us to deliver impact. And um, if somebody does not understand exactly that, it's not really, all about you if you're an important piece in the puzzle but it's not all about you and understanding the other moving pieces and how it applies it's they we are setting ourselves up to face conflict uh, uh, down the line so having a sense of empathy is something that i really look for in anybody that is joining in understanding like hey the cause is the, the top priority you're very important in us achieving that but there are so many other pieces making this work so let's work together to make it happen. Great, thank you so much, Cedric. Rebecca D. <laughs> Everything, yes. And uh, and yeah, just, just people that want to turn up with a solution. Like I know you said solutions focused, right? But it, I used to think that really it was just in the startup space that you needed to be good at pivoting. And then of course, you know you get into the actual doing of it in a social enterprise and you're like you know your whole job is pivoting all the time <laughs> you're always trying to think about your it's like the business plan i wrote you know however many years ago i might as well rip up and throw away because it means nothing to what we're doing now and but, but you don't just want people that that come to you and tell you the problem like you know be part of the solution own Just the solution right. come with a solution so yeah, solutions focused. We we have this little saying, um, positivity finger, that's our thing. And we're like, you know, I'm gonna give you the positivity <laughs> finger because you you need to just bring the positive and the and the what's possible and the solutions rather than focusing on the negative. That's something I think is a characteristic of a, a high performing person. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate. Uh, you all, and we could talk about this for another half hour, but I'm conscious of our time and the time that we have left. Um, Alicia, is there any additional burning questions that we should respond to? Well, I thought, um, thanks, Patty. I thought this one really dovetailed nicely with what you were just talking about. And somebody asked about what metrics you could use to measure all those characteristics of the right high performing people and are they specific or unique to social enterprise organizations um they're not unique just some of them quite a few of them are unique to social enterprise organizations but a good overarching of them are not um, high performers are everywhere <laughs> and in every sector as well i think one of the measurements that i know that um I use, and it, it, it is around um, the performance management system itself, uh, their goals, uh, their, we talk about KPIs a lot. Uh, those are all measurements, and, and I call them measurements of success. Um, generally with top performers, they are measuring and collecting their own data. Uh, they have data points and metrics that they can deliver on a moment's notice. And uh, they do share those with you as well. Um, Rebecca P, anything you'd like to add there on metrics that you've seen um, that can be used? Well, one, I'm just pumped that our first question was on how do we measure it? 
so snaps to that question <laughs> after. Um, and Patty, same thing as you, what I'd say is if you're a social entrepreneur and you have limited time that you're in resources, you're able to allocate, I would say a starting point, everyone has to hire when you're hiring. If you have not managed to get a trained system in place on how you're ranking your inbound assessments of talent, put it in place now. You can do it in an Excel sheet and start gathering data. It's as simple as when you ask someone, um, what do you hope to learn, gain, or develop in this role? And you rank them one to five, starting to codify what a five looks like, a four, a three, a two, and a one. If you are assessing someone's um, ambiguity tolerance. Similarly, you're going to rank it one to five. Once you start getting this data and you're not spending any extra time getting it, you're just adding a number when you do an interview in an Excel sheet. When you come, when it comes time at the three month mark, you can go back and now you've worked with this person, you kind of know their competence and you can score one to five across the same competencies you looked for. Go back. Did you get it right when you were selecting this person? If you didn't and you didn't over time at scale, you need to get better at selection. If you did get it right and they're not performing in the role, did you hire what you needed? So my, my strongest recommendation is if you're not tracking your hypotheses on what someone's talent is on the way in, then you actually can't systematically build your learning and build that muscle. So I wouldn't wait, I'd start now um, and start to build that muscle or practice as you scale across your hiring managers, your management practice and team and start to define that capability. But it's certainly something that I'd say can become unique within your organization as to what a high performer looks like within your organization, which is why there's a lot of great places to start on defining these competencies. I personally use Lominger Corn Ferries competence models, but every organization I work for or help tailors those competencies to what that looks like in their organization. And that muscle gets built by getting the data in, using your performance management systems as a way to keep building that muscle. That's right. That's right. Uh, Rebecca D and uh, Cedric, anything you'd like to add um, in terms of metrics? We uh, a system of 360 degree feedback where um, we don't just ask. You know, when I when I do performance reviews with people, I don't just ask them what how they think they're doing. I ask their colleagues, I ask their customers, I ask their, you know, other vendors that they have to talk to. I ask. So it's really and I ask them too to rank themselves, but I ask from from everybody's different perspective of how a person is is perceived and is working. And I think that's really helpful in um, as a metric to help people listen to that feedback of, of how they're being perceived. Great, thank you so much. Rebecca D, uh, Cedric and Rebecca P, thank you so much for your uh, time today and partnering with me on CETA by Nonprofit HR's first webinar. And we are super excited that we've launched and uh, I'm super excited about continuing the conversation around social enterprises. This is the space that I love and that I thrive in as a top performer myself. So thank you so much. I'm humbled that you have partnered with uh, CETA by Nonprofit HR today. I'm sure, Alicia, that there were some burning questions that we didn't get to in the chat, um, but I do want everyone to know that we will answer them uh, after the webinar and, and follow up uh, with any question responses to the questions that you've had. Um, Alicia, is there anything else in the last second that we have? Ah. <laughs> no, thank you, Patty. And thank you, Rebecca, Rebecca and Cedric for this really insightful and inspiring conversation. Um, I think you all could have gone on for, for a bit longer because there's so many great things to talk about and I'm sure our audience certainly appreciated um, everything you had to offer. Um, Please keep in mind, we have many, many more webinars coming your way in 2021, and you can check out these events um, at um, our events calendar on go to CETA.com. 
And uh, please be sure to complete the feedback survey that will pop up once the webcast has ended. Your comments help us with planning and can inform the topics that we cover as well. You'll also receive a follow-up email, uh, follow email, as we mentioned, with a link to the recording, the slides, and the SHRM and the HRCI Rita certification codes. And that will come in the next few days. Um, but if you'd like more information about available services or support from CETA by Nonprofit HR, please visit us online at goceta.com. And we want to, again, thank you all for coming. And thank you again to our wonderful presenters. We hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.